What was your first experience of a computer and how did you come across it? Sure. First experience of a computer, um, quite unusual for a Brit really because I had an uncle who worked in IT in America and he was coming back and forward. And one of my first memories was him using his Apple II. Um, and I distinctly remember Oregon Trail and the scene of trying to get across the river and failing miserably. Um, that was, that's the first memory I think I have of seeing uh, a computer in use. The first computer I actually owned myself, though, was an Amstrad CPC. I think I got the bug as soon as I saw that Apple II. I, like, I want a computer. I didn't know it was an Apple II. I just wanted this interactive thing on the screen. Uh, and for whatever reason, my parents chose an Amstrad CPC 464. They must have been a bit flush because we got the color monitor with it. And, of course, the Amsoft pack that comes with it and all the games. So, yeah, Amstrad CPC is where it started for me. Yeah. And which of the computers do you remember from that era? Oh, lots of them. Um, yeah, I ha my long-term memory is brilliant. My short-term memory, not so much, which helps in the kind of job that I do. <laughs> um, so I remember on the estate, my friends would be sort of divided up according to what computers they had. So if I wanted to go and play on the Spectrum, I'd go and see uh, Mike. The, the master system, it would be Adam, you know. So all of the 8-bit computers were spread out among all my friends so I, I probably had access to most of them and then of course in the classroom it was BBC Micro for everything I don't I didn't know anyone with a BBC Micro outside of the classroom so I think I probably had access to most of them not many people came knocking at my door to play on the Amstrad I have to say <laughs> and what games did you remember playing are the ones that you had or ones that your friends had well, of course, the first ones would have been the Amsoft pack. I don't know if you remember that. It's like this big cellophane pack with, I don't know, 15 or so um, Amsoft games. The first one I loaded up probably would have been um, Harrier Attack. I was quite fond of that. Um, I think the Falklands were still fresh in everyone's mind. I want to fly a Harrier. Um, and then Roland on the ropes and all the Roland games. Um, so those are the first ones I remember. Um, I was always really impressed and, and jealous of my console owning friends, I have to say. I've always been a microcomputer man, but when I saw the Master System um, and, the, and the NES even, and what it could do compared to my Amstrad, I was always a bit jealous. I'd never admit it. You couldn't admit it on the playground. That was admitting weakness. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, Bridget is the one that everyone seems to remember from from the Amsoft pack for being so terrible. Um, it sticks in my memory that one because it's the beginning and the middle and end of gaming history for my mum. It's the only video game she has genuinely ever played in her life. All right. <laughs> is that the one where you can't fire if you're walking? The guy's walking and you have to hit a key and there's like different bridges across the screen yeah. and like some are up and some are down so you have to have them in the right position at the right time so the guy can make it across the screen. Um, yeah, it's not a good game by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, you think over the years um, tragedies happen and lazy reporting always points the finger at video games, doesn't it? Like Doom and Carmageddon or all the way back to the 2600 and Custer's Revenge and things like that. And I often think, what's going through my mum's mind, you know? If this is her entire history of video games, is Bridget. Is she, is she thinking to herself, when she sees these things and video games are blamed, is she thinking, well, if I hadn't stopped playing Bridget, you know, would I be in the market for an automatic weapon, you know? <laughs> and if you played Bridget for 30 years, you probably would be, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I've gone off topic there. <laughs> I like the off topic. the better. How big is your games collection and how big was it originally? Have you rebought things over the years? Or? I think like many people, I had to sell to move to the next generation. So I had, you know, probably hundreds of Amstrad CPC games. I don't know how many were genuine. There were lots were obviously copied, but um, I had to sell them on with the machine to get my uh, Amiga collection. I probably most regret selling my Amiga collection. Uh, there was a guy near me who, um, before eBay was big, he just had this unit in the middle of town and you could just go and trade just like just like CEX these days. Um, but he would pay you know pennies for Amiga games and I sold them all off and I regret it. Um, I, I, I've got nothing for that collection really and I'd love to have them all on my shelves now, especially the LucasArts games and the Sierra Big Box games. Oh, yeah. I miss them especially. And they're so expensive to get hold of now. Um, so... And then moving on to the to the present day, it's more machines that I collect, and system uh, and games happen to come bundled with them. So my collection is growing, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. 
I did buy in the hall today um, a Psygnosis game, Barbarian Melbourne House just because I've always wanted to build up a good Psygnosis collection because I really love the cover art on those games. Um, and I've got to start somewhere. So I thought, okay, I'm going to buy my first you know, Psygnosis game now in the modern day, put it on my shelf and start that collection. Good one to start with. Yeah. Well. yeah. And what was your first wall moment when you first saw something on a computer or you know, a console where you thought, that's, that's what I want one of these mm, for? Mm, something that really wowed me. Um, it's something that doesn't happen much these days because uh, computer development is so iterative now but back then we had such big generational jumps from the 8 to 16 bit era is the biggest one that I remember going from the Amstrad to I went to the Amiga 500 after that and I think that was a friend's house they had the Amiga I think they were playing Silkworm something like that and I just remember thinking it was such a close to perfect arcade conversion and it blew away anything that my Amstrad did do. Um, it was just smooth so many more colors it was just brilliant um, just a to pass Slob's game room gets everywhere everywhere you can't miss him um, so that was like the, the first real quantum leap I think and I got the Amiga 500 when it was pretty new there was still a lot more that the developers eked out of that system and there were a lot more wow moments throughout the life of that system especially in the demo scene the things the guys came up with in that um, so there and I, and I think the only sort of the next wow moment that I'd put close to that would be when I'd moved on from the Amiga I moved on to the PC I think it was probably when I moved into the, my first 3D effects card when you go from the software rendering it was probably Tomb Raider, maybe a game called EF2000, one of the first games that supported 3D effects. You put that, that hardware rendering on, and that was a big wow moment. And it probably wasn't repeated again until modern day VR, until I got a VR headset on. And I've got that stereoscopic depth, you know, and, and the, the head movement and everything. That, that, they're probably my three wow moments, yeah. 16 bit era, 3D effects, hardware acceleration, and VR. Do you still play games nowadays, old games? I do, yeah. yeah. I probably play more old games than I do modern games, um, just because they're so much quicker to get into. You, know, you can really jump in and just play for five minutes at a time if you want to. Um, I'd like to play more than, more than I do, um, because a large part of what I do is repairing systems. And what's the point of repairing systems if you're not going to use them? You're just going to put them on a shelf. So I try to play as much as I can. I'm trying to do more... Uh, game reviews on my channel because that gives me the reason <laughs> to play games yeah. more you know I can go on right I get a video out of this and I get to play a game so I'm trying to do that more and more um, yeah I'm really enjoying um, I got I managed to buy a Packard Bell 486 recently and it's the, the exact first model of PC I, I, I'm not endorsing Packard Bell in any way <laughs> you're holding them up on a mantle but it, it was the first Packard Bell PC that I owned so it's a bit of nostalgia for me and I've been revisiting all of those 486 games like Day of the Tentacle you know TFX things like that Indiana Jones um, Book and Click Adventures things like that um, so I'm really enjoying them at the moment the problem I have with modern games is how much effort you have to put into um, to actually get get out of them. You yeah. know, you really have to learn the games inside out and all the controls. I'm sure you know there are exceptions to every rule, but I find them they take a lot more work to get into. So, yeah. yeah, pick up and play old games, brilliant. Do what do you think about remakes of old games? Not necessarily the new Tomb Raider, the old Tomb Raider, but when you someone's developing a new version of a Tick Attack at the minute. On, on PC, full colour, mm. um, exact same gameplay. I've got nothing against remakes. I like a good remake, um, and they're nothing new. If you think back to the Sierra days, you had in the eighties, you had um, Police Quest, King's Quest, Legend Suit Larry, all of those games, and then in the early nineties, they were all remade in VGA. So you got that graphical upgrade. So it's, it's nothing new. Um, the question is, is it needed? Um, in the case of those VGA updates, yeah, I like them. Attic Attack these these are games you're going back to games that depending so much on the gameplay and not so much on the graphics so if you're updating it is the core gameplay the same and are you going to get more out of it by having better graphics I don't know are you going to get a better experience I still love playing Jetpack on the Spectrum which is a 16k game what are, you, what are you going to do if you remake that maybe give it slightly better graphics but that gameplay is unbeatable um, just like 
Robotron is still one of my favourite arcades from 1981. So remakes, I've got nothing against them, but there needs to be a purpose. Why not remake games that people don't remember fondly? Remake games that need to be fixed, not get games that people already love. That would be my approach to it. Yeah. I think similar thing with, with films for me. I don't think people keep remaking old films. I think exactly the same as you. Why don't they remake ones that people don't remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they admit they got it wrong that <laughs> yeah, time, and exactly. let's make some, let's make it better. Yeah, RoboCop three. Let's <laughs> yeah. let's forget that happened and try again. Yeah, <laughs> not RoboCop one. Yeah. When you think back about old gaming, what image comes to mind? Do you have a, a certain company logo or a favourite loading screen or a uh, character from a game that you always think of with 80s gaming? Mm. It would probably be the ones that I associate with quality, like the LucasArts, LucasArts one was awesome, or the Sierra Mountain that appeared. Um, you knew you were in for a good time um, when those games loaded up. Um, and of course, um, Rare, or at the time, Ultimate played the game. You knew you were in for a good time when you loaded up one of those games. Not so much Amsoft. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, very evocative though when you see those logos now. They really they do bring back a lot of memories. Before you've even seen the game, you see the logo flash up and you're like, yeah. <laughs> I just stopped there and hold that memory, yeah. <laughs> so out of the three main competitors, there's the uh, Spectrum, the Commodore and the Amstrad. Are you, you're voting for Amstrad, I assume. Uh, the best ah, I didn't have a Commodore 64 at the time. I, didn't, I don't think I really had much access to a Commodore 64 at the time so I didn't really appreciate how good it was and I, I um, refurbished a C64C about a year ago and really got a good insight into it and what it can do and how much better it is with the, the hardware sprites and things like that than the Amstrad um, the Spectrum I respect because it was such a limited machine that what people did with it was incredible within the confinements of it yes the C64 was limited but it had the extra it had the SID chip it had the extra um, oh what's the graphics chip called the VIC chip that you know really helped where it was all on the CPU and the ULA in the spectrum so um, I, I really appreciate the Commodore 64 a lot more now I feel it's my obligation to say Amstrad because I had Amstrad and those playground fights are still in me but if I had to pick out of those three probably the Commodore 64 I'd have to admit is, is the better computer yeah and same question for the Amiga and the Atari ST. Because oh, I watched one of your, your videos. Yeah. Um, fully refurbished an Amiga. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Yeah, that's the uh, the Trash to Treasure series. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Amiga Atari. It has to be Amiga. Um, there's <laughs> it no. It doesn't have to be. It is Amiga. <laughs> it is Amiga. And uh, there's no, you know. These silly playground arguments, they're not bad blood anymore. Everyone's just joking when they say Amiga's better than Atari and things like that. Um, I mostly do it to wind up uh, Dr. Andrew Armstrong at the back office show because he's another YouTuber who, who loves his Atari. So if you're listening, Andrew, Amiga is better than Atari. <laughs> <laughs> What were you? Were you a Spectrum man? I'm a Spectrum, but yeah. Ah, I, okay. I, I actually started off as a ZX81. Mm. Um, had that for, I think, two years. Um, got a Spectrum 48 for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, rubber Keys. Yeah. Got, yeah. got a Plus 2 in 1987, I think. Came with the equivalent of the Amsoft pack. Okay. A light gun as well. That was good. Oh, yes. <laughs> you, could, you could get the James Pond pack. James Pond. James Bond pack. Couldn't you you could, light gun. yeah. I didn't yeah. have that one. But that was getting, that was still being sold like 1990 alongside yeah. the 16 bit things. Yeah. Who's going to buy that? Definitely Spectrum for me, though. Yeah. Love Spectrum. Yeah. Teletext wise, what are your memories of Teletext? Mm. Yeah, well, two things basically. Digitizer, everyone who was into computers went to Digitizer, and Bamboozle. That's that. Those are my memories of Teletext. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bamboozle, or whatever his name was, and, and hit and reveal to get the daily joke before you go to school in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember any, any 80s cartoons? Yeah, um, I used to get up, especially early on the weekday. Something silly like six o'clock on a, every, you know, on a, on a school day to watch um, Jason the World Warriors mm -hmm. and Ulysses. Uh, what was the full title? Ulysses something. Ulysses thirty one. Thirty one. I wanted yeah. to say twenty one. Thirty one. <laughs> um, they were sort of those Japanese sort of anime style uh, animation. I don't know why I loved them so much. Um, 
and, and I really loved the fact that I was up and watching them before anyone else was out of bed. It, was, <laughs> it just made them all the more special. This is my secret you know, cartoon time. Um, so those were the big ones that I really enjoyed. And then, of course, things like... Um, does Trapdoor count? I know it's Claymation. Yeah, Claymation. Yeah, Trapdoor. That was a great Spectrum game as well. Yeah. Um, Trapdoor. Um, yeah. And then I, I could rattle through, you know, all the normal ones that people quote, but I think it was it was those two specifically that I really enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. What was your favourite lesson at school? I tell you, my least favourite was maths. <laughs> <I love> maths. <laughs> um, I was predicted an F in my GCSE maths. And uh, the, the only reason I changed it was because I decided to learn programming. So I picked up a C programming book and something clicked in my brain after I'd sort of gone through the logic of learning how to program and I managed to sort of breeze through it. Anyway, that wasn't the question. The question was, <laughs> what's your favourite lesson? Um, we didn't have IT lessons, so there, there wasn't that. Well, I don't know, we did, we did. We had IT lessons and it was all based around Microsoft Word and sell and things like that so I wouldn't say I enjoyed them because they didn't cover what I wanted to cover um, and usually for someone in IT perhaps I liked PE I played uh, did a lot of running played a lot of football I think I got an A star so there you go I, I'll have to say that because it's the highest grade I got <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, I discovered girls and then computers even more so that all fell by the wayside so. <laughs> excellent how in depth was your program? Oh no, no, I, not anymore. Like, I, I was like teenager. I thought, right, teach myself C. Love that. Um, I went to college and did computer science. Right. And like for some reason they were like, right, we're going to start with Pascal. So I went around C to Pascal, which was okay, it's similar, but it wasn't a step forward. And then in the second year at um, college, we were supposed to go on to C, but the C lecturer went off sick. So they decided to teach us COBOL in the 90s and it's like uh, well yeah I could probably make a lot of money out of that now with you know looking after very old banking systems but it didn't seem very forward looking at the time um, and then I went and did um, software engineering and management at uh, Bournemouth Uni and then for some reason I just moved sideways into like sysadmin, network admin, IT manager, IT director and went through the career that way so um, I think I decided I really liked programming as a hobby. Yeah. And as soon as it started becoming right, someone else was telling me what I had to program. I was like, oh, I don't like this. No, I like all. writing parallax scrollers and things like that. <laughs> I don't like writing, you know, I don't know, databases. So, yeah, it's completely... Yeah. 